This is Galen at ECU Master. Uh, we're going to work on some shielded wire today. So the point of shielded wire is to keep noise out of certain electrical components and electrical circuits, uh, things like knock sensors, anything you don't want interference on. And today we're going to show you how to terminate this shielding onto another wire. So we've got a couple examples here we're going to work with. This is a two wire shielded wire. Uh, braid on the outside, it's kind of hard to see in the camera, but once I strip it back, you'll be able to see it pretty clearly. And we're going to terminate this 20 gauge strip of wire here onto the exposed shielding um, from the outside of this wire. It can be a little bit of a pain to strip back and you got to work careful. Um, if you get in there too deep, unfortunately you'll end up severing the wire. And if you already cut it to the exact length you need, then you've just ruined it. So I'll show you guys a couple ways to accomplish that without ruining your project. So one of the methods for stripping shielded wire is taking a pair of flush cuts or some kind of fine um, cutting utensil. I wouldn't use any heavy dikes because it's hard to feel where you are in the shielding. Um, the goal of this is to not actually cut through the braid, not to cut through the wires on the inside, but really just to sever the outside coating of this wire so that you can expose the end. For this example, I think most people are going to have access to some sort of heat gun and a solder bead like this. You can order them in packs. Uh, it's a little easier to work with in tight spaces, so if you're adding something after the fact, you know, I don't shame anyone for using these because I, I get it. You can't fit a, you know, an open splice like that and then a tool to hold it all together. It's too much going on. So we're going to show you guys how to use this guy right here. There's a couple ways to remove the shielding from the wires inside the core here. Uh, this method that we're going to show now uses a pick. And then at the base of your wiring, of your shielded wire, you can see that we have a conductor exposed. So now we're just going to go and fish this out. It's a little tedious and you want to be super careful that you're not ripping stuff and that you don't stab yourself in the process. So now we've got one conductor out. You can see our other one here. Number two coming out. And try and pinch on your shielded braid here so you're not pulling on it too, too much. So now you have this. Go ahead and pretty this up. Yep. You can see here we have our two conductors exposed for the core. You have your shield exposed here. This is your the sheath from the outside and you're going to pick where you want the solder bead to land. Ideally you can get this rubber, this little blue band at the end here. It'll, end, it'll help seal this inside of the braid again uh, so that it's not exposed and not trapping fluids, dirt, whatever you may have you. So it looks like our solder bead goes to maybe six mil, seven mil back from the end of the, of the shield and we're going to strip this back to do about the same Let's get this in here. Oh. Awesome. So now we're just going to give a quick trim. Now we're going to put it all together. And you can see you have the copper here. You have the copper from the conductor for your drain wire. You have your braid from the shield and then you have your conductors from the core. So now we've got our heat gun ready. What you're going to do is you're going to start from the end of the braid working this way. Uh, the idea being that when this band seals up around the conductors and the end of the braid, it'll help prevent some of that excess solder getting onto your conductors and wicking its way uh, back and under the shield as best as you can. You might still get some capillary action and some wicking up the braid itself, uh, but this will help mitigate it from getting into anywhere uh, you don't want it to go. So let's, gonna, let's turn this thing on and get firing.
and you can see we're getting the solder to wet out evenly. This is wetted out and recovered onto the conductors. Your bead has ended up right around the core and the exposed uh, braid. And then the solder again, starting to wet out nicely onto the shielded braid and onto this conductor. We're gonna go a little longer and then we'll seal it up. So there you have it. So here you have it. The jacket is fully recovered here. This is wetted out nicely onto both of the exposed wires. This is sealed up nicely on the end. And then this is recovered nicely leading backwards away from the exposed core. Uh, something to bear in mind that this, the solder beads are great for this kind of application. Things that are low amperage and maybe a little less stressed out than something like a splice for 12 volt feed or anything that's going to have high amperage or maybe something you might expect to see a relatively high resistance in the conductor because it is solder and it will remelt if you get it hot enough so just bear that in mind when you're picking what you're going to use for certain certain kinds of splices and we're going to show you guys another method here too to be able to terminate onto this braided wire here. If you don't have a pick or if you feel like you don't have the space to get in there with the tool and manipulate stuff around, you can for, oh, straighten this out and fray it by hand. It's a little more time consuming, uh, but it saves you from having to manipulate another set of tools. So we're gonna get, a, get ahead and get going on that right here. We've got this stuff split off to one side now. It's mostly unfrayed. And now that we've straightened it out, we're gonna do the same thing and just keep it peeled back so that the wires all orient in the same direction. Um, so we're gonna pick a different method here. Instead of using another solder bead, like we just showed you guys, we're gonna pick this closed barrel splice here. And it's gonna end up in some kind of orientation like this. So we're gonna give it a whack now. Try to keep your workspace neat and keep all of that debris out and clear as much as possible. Um, doesn't look like it's all that annoying, but it can be, especially when you're getting it under your fingernails. And I don't wish that upon my worst enemy. Just trying to keep the end of these wires a little neat and less frayed. I have the shakes right now because I just had a coffee. Like most of you in the industry, I'm sure you've had a coffee as you're watching this. So there you have it. It's in there pretty nice and tight. And you still have a nice bend here. It's not completely tight where it's yanking on it so much. I'm just gonna trim off a little bit of the extra, extra strands that didn't make it in. And we're gonna crimp that down. And then when you're done, you would heat shrink over top. For this, we're going to use these snap-on crimpers. Um, they're not fancy tooling, but this is what most of most people, I think, would have in their toolbox at home to do something like this. You have that nice indent, indent right there, and the receptacle at the bottom, the positioner, and the locator. So you go ahead and give that a good old squeeze. If you feel like you don't have enough space, turn it 
up a little bit, press there, press there, another one. And that should be plenty strong on a strain test. I mean, if you if you pull hard enough on this, you might get you might hurt the end of this, the shield a little bit. But really, this is more force than I think anyone would be putting on a wire harness, except if you're unbolting something and you forgot to undo the ground. We have our heat shrink tubing here, and we're going to position it over the end of this. So we'll fold it back, and like we mentioned before, your target is from roughly here to here on the wire. That way you have room for the heat shrink to recover and seal around everything you've been working on. So we'll go ahead and give that a whack. If I had to eyeball it and say it's about 15 mil or so, but if you want to be extra sure, you can lay it out on top of what you're going to be sealing. And let's pick here. That looks good to me. It's a little bit longer, but longer is okay. Uh, so long as it's not getting in the way of anything else. All right, so I can feel here. This is where this wire and the shielding are terminated. And I can feel that that bead ends here, that uh, closed barrel splice. So I'll go ahead and seal it up. As you work, you can see the heat shrink recovering and sealing around the ends here. And I think we've got the whole thing. Awesome. And this would typically go inside another loom or, or in a, a main concentric twist or however you have it set up. So sealing this right off the rip uh, might not be necessary, though we have adhesive lined it now. Um, just as a good practice. If you have access to adhesive line tubing, you know where to order it. Or even if you find a motorsport supply shop to order it from, I recommend you getting some for things like this because it'll help keep this uh, really reliable and give it a better service life than it would without having an adhesive line heat shrink. Yep. So we already talked about the solder bead here that we use in our previous example here. Um, they come in a bunch of different sizes. We had an extra and this is another one you could use. Let me grab it so you guys don't have to look at my fingers. This would be a butt splice in which you would take one end of your conductor here and then the other end going this way. So in this case it would have been this shield drain and then the shield on this side and you would crimp both ends independently and then seal it up in the heat shrink like so. Now the next example that we have and probably the most difficult example to use is the mighty parallel splice. You see this guy here, it's open on one side, so it's quick, it can be quick, because you can just load stuff in through the top. You don't have to worry about sliding things through. And that's what makes these so appealing for a lot of people. But the biggest issue is that it's a little tricky to use because there's a lot of things going on typically. And let me show you what I mean by that. Say for example, that we were gonna do all this join it together for whatever reason. It's not, it's not uncommon for you to have parallel splices in other parts of the loom for something like 5 volt supply, sensor ground, etc. But you can see how heavily populated that the, sense that the parallel splice becomes. Uh, and in this application, this is a little bit too small for what we're doing. But the point being, there's a lot of moving parts. It's really hard to fixture this and this and this all in the same spot, all at the same time, and be able to crimp it down you know, with your tool. So this would be more for an advanced user or somebody that has the tooling to get it done. That was our project for today. And we're gonna go over more videos that'll show you how to do different types of terminals, connections, splices, etc.